then you just have a checkbox probably on your screen that says, oh, by the way, we're, we're recording this. So welcome. This is our canceled class session on Thursday, February 23, second snow event in the semester. And like I said, this isn't even my record. I think like four or five years ago, we lost three single Thursday night classes to snow events. So in, in the pre-Zoom era, so there wasn't even this reasonable facility for running a class session. What I'm going to do is show you where we are and then show you some fun things we'll do and then get into some calculations and some graphics today. So I'm going to share my website right here. And we're in our space right here. And we're doing pretty well. I, I want you to think of week six and seven and eight as all going together. They all belong together. In fact, I might be mentioning a few things that are in section three, seven and three, six tonight, possibly. I just don't know how things will go. And we may not have said everything we needed to say in three, one and three, two and three, three. We were a bit rushed last time. I think I can fill in some things that'll help you do three, three and such. But our goal tonight is to solidify the major cases of linear systems and then begin to discuss the special cases. And that will all make more sense to you as we go along. Uh, talk a little bit more about what a phase portrait is for a linear system. Talk about the nature of equilibrium points in a linear system. I hinted last week that instead of the three options in one dimension, sink source node, we have 13 options in two dimensions. And uh, you have, when we meet again, I'll share the booklet I prepared for you, even with color graphics, but you have access to the handouts on our website. In an email, let's go into week seven. I pointed out that I have a lot of videos on this topic here. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is since you're handing an exam, I'm giving you problems from 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, and 3, 4 to be due next week. And then we'll finish up chapter three with the following homework. But yeah, you didn't do any homework yet from 3, 1, 3, 2, and 3, 3. And that's another reason why we hopped around a little bit. I have. Apart from these handouts and linear systems, which I shared with you the images last time, I have a lot of videos about linear systems to cover all the things that happen. And they generally are happening in two and three minute videos, maybe some fours or fives, I don't know. But I do have them grouped by topic. So first batch right here, the basics of what a linear system is, matrices, vectors, matrix, multiplication, trace, determinant, characteristic equation. We showed you all that last week. I'll show you a fun trick with a quadratic formula shortly. And then we're gonna need some other help with complex numbers. And we did actually talk a little bit about the adjusted matrix last time. Let me get someone else in the room. Talked a little bit about the adjusted matrix last time in a way, but now you can see what it really does for you. So certainly you begin by watching these videos about linear system basics. Then we've actually talked about some of the ideas here in this second batch, linear systems, real non-zero eigenvalues. So we've talked a little bit about linearly independent solutions, though I didn't use that phrase, general solutions, specific solutions, basic eigenvalues and eigenvectors. These are videos that talk about the key topics and show you some nice graphics about how solutions to linear systems look. Third batch right here, complex eigenvalues. You'll see why we need those tonight. And uh, you'll enjoy calculating with the complex numbers actually. But these videos will show you some of the facets or some of the consequences 
of calculating with the complex numbers and having to deal with complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors. Then there's another couple here we may or may not get to this week, maybe next week, but these fall in the category of the bifurcation cases, the special cases, what we playfully call the almost eigenvector for a particular reason. Uh, in linear algebra, it's called the generalized eigenvector, but you'll see what that does for you in those videos. So you could watch all these videos right now, and then you'll say, oh, that's what he was talking about when you get to it. But you certainly can consume everything tonight in the first three batches after tonight, the first two batches you could consume now. Under technology, I have some Mathematica notebooks to help you. I even have some Desmos images because since we're demonstrating action in the plane, Desmos still quite credible. So we might see some images from there later, but let me see, I get someone just coming in, hang on, letting people in as they appear. But I do want to draw your attention to first order linear systems, the notebook right here. This notebook will graph any of the images I'm asking you to produce in chapter three, certainly. And so I might demo this notebook later tonight. And I did update this notebook so that it has the correct coloring commands that I demonstrated in the stream plot coloring example notebook. So the first order linear systems notebook is helpful. First order systems could also do the job. And I'm not sure why I have two copies of that. I think I just have two links accidentally. And first order system phase portrait. Okay, again, that could do the job, but that's probably a special example I threw in there just for an illustration. So do examine this Mathematica notebook, first order linear systems this week. Do use it to generate your images. Okay, good. No, nope, I don't want to go there, but I mean, you find, you find it right here. First order linear systems, but we'll get that later. Okay, back out, back out. As I was saying, ostensibly, we're talking about 3, 4, and 3, 5 tonight, but we're really talking about 3, 3, 3, 4, and 3, 5. We're really moving around within those cases. I'm going to back out. So four problems due next week, exam due by 11.59 p.m. tonight, and then I'll try to get that graded and certainly back to you by next week, but hopefully sooner. We'll see what happens. I'm going to leave this window. I'm going to go back to the paper. So first, let's have some fun that uh, you say you're just playing around. But uh, I want to remind you some things about the complex numbers that you probably know or have known, but you haven't understood necessarily the full power of them. And so you've done most of your experience in the real numbers, of course, but complex numbers are more complete. And there are many calculations that you do that you have to use complex numbers. And as you go along, if your interest was to do more mathematics, oh, someday you would redo calculus using only the complex numbers. And it would be a heck of a lot of fun because things in some sense get simpler when you use the complex numbers. And that is the paradox I want to point out to you right now. Most people's view of the complex numbers is that they're more complicated. Actually, the complex numbers are in many ways simpler to deal with than the real numbers. So I'll show you a couple shortcuts that you may be aware of, but may not be aware of, but they're gonna come in handy as we work tonight. Then I'll hit a couple of matrix facts. I'm probably talking about the first hour right here. Remind you of what we talked about with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and then move on. So I also have to get used to 
writing larger. Writing small is not bad for notes, but it's not excellent for the camera. But you know, you can full screen this, but maybe I'll try to write a little bit larger. So complex number, remember, uses the imaginary unit, this letter i that's the square root of minus one, or the number whose square is minus one. It's called the imaginary unit. Okay, there's an example of writing too small. And with that, you can create numbers that not show up on the number line, only the real number line, but actually show up in the plane. Imaginary unit, we can create an imaginary axis with one i, two i, minus i, just like we have a real axis with one, two, minus one. And we can locate numbers in this complex plane, such as three plus two i. Now, if you're interested in the notation I'm using, again, I'm gonna to try to write bigger. I write the c, the r, the i, I wrote those all with like an extra slash on them. That's a traditional way you write in mathematics. I'd like to make a bold R. I'd like to make a bold C. I'd like to make a bold I. But I'm not going to scratch a bold C on the paper. That would just spend time and destroy the paper. So sometimes people add an extra slash to tell you, oh, that's a bold face letter. So the complex numbers are numbers that real number plus real number times this imaginary unit. And people's first experience with the complex numbers is that they doubt that they're even numbers. So the first time you saw this, you doubted that they were even numbers at all. Of course, the first time you saw fractions, you thought someone was crazy when they said one third plus three sevenths is 16 twenty ones. Right? Do you remember the first time you saw that and you just looked at your whatever fourth grade teacher and said, You're making this up? You know, where's the 16 coming from? And then you learn to do this, right? So think about this as an analogy. Fractions at one time to you were foreign. But frankly, I showed you, someone showed you how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide fractions. And then you accepted them as numbers. So if it acts like a number, if it quacks like a number, it must be a number. And if you can add, subtract, and multiply, and divide these ratios to create other ratios, and they obey the irregular laws of arithmetic, they must be numbers. Now, likewise, with complex numbers, that if I said 3 plus 3i plus 4 minus 7i, if I show you how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide them, you add them by adding like terms. You subtract them by subtracting like terms. Before you say this is too simple, hang on for a second. You multiply them as in a sense, you multiplied 3 plus 3x times 4 minus 7x. You multiply them by foiling. But the additional step you get when you foil these is that you realize that i times i, again, i squared is minus 1, so that you can foil this out, 12 minus 21i plus 12i minus 21 i squared, and then realize that the i squared is a real number, minus 1, negative 21, negative 1, plus 21, plus 12, 33, minus 9 i. So you can add, subtract, and multiply them. The one that gives people fits, though, is dividing until you learn one unassuming a beautiful calculation. 
So what makes these numbers real to you, I shouldn't use the word real, what makes the numbers legitimate to you is that you add two complex numbers and you get back a complex number in the same form. Subtract, here's another complex number. Even multiply after I simplified, I get a complex number in standard form. Standard form is real number part plus real number times imaginary unit. Always write complex numbers in standard form. If you want to divide two complex numbers, you're having a hard time writing in standard form. So you multiply on the bottom by this little helper for plus seven I. Let me rewrite this neatly. Three plus three I divided by four minus seven I. What I do is multiply top and bottom by four plus seven I. And this is more sophisticated and useful than people think. Because on the bottom, I get 16 minus 28I plus 28I. And then let me just shortcut. Minus seven times positive seven is negative 49. I times I is negative one. So I get plus 49. 16 plus 49 is 65. These I pieces are canceled out. So on the bottom, I get 65. On the top, I go ahead and multiply ordinarily. 3 times 4 is 12. 3i times 7i is minus 21. 12 minus 21 is negative 9. And then I get 12i's on the inside and 21i's on the outside, plus 33i's. I hope I'm doing my arithmetic quickly. I'm rushing too much. Double check. 12 minus 21 plus 12 plus 21. Looks good. And then even this is not approachable right now. It's not standard form. So to write standard form, I write minus 9 over 65 plus 33 over 65i. So I multiplied two things in this form, and I got a third thing in this form, an ugly looking thing, a strange looking thing, but a legitimate number in complex form. Now, multiplying, adding, subtracting, dividing complex numbers doesn't have to be a burden because any calculator would do this with you anyway. But you should know how to do this yourself. But the thing that you should really know is this idea that when you multiply a plus bi times a minus bi, you're getting a massive gift. And that is that a times a is a squared. In the middle, I have plus abi minus abi. So those are gone. But on the end, I have Check it out, three steps, a minus, a b squared, and an i squared. But the i squared is worth a minus. So minus b squared i squared is the same as plus b squared. And do not shake your head at this. When you multiply two numbers, complex numbers, with the imaginary part sign changed, these are called conjugates. All you have to do in place of the foiling, is just square the first number A and square the second number B and add them together. So you should be very aware of that technique because it comes up a lot. When I did four plus seven I times four minus seven I, I didn't need to foil it out. I could have just said 16 plus 49 is 65. If I do two minus three I, and 2 plus 3i, I don't have to foil that out. I just say 4 plus 9 is 13. So complex conjugates are special partners that simplify multiplying and simplify dividing. So you know that whenever you have complex conjugate numbers, then you're in a special place. Someone is doing you a massive favor. So I'll give you another example. Let's say I have lambda squared plus four lambda plus 13 equals zero. 
Now, this is a quadratic equation. I'm using the lambda because that's what we've used for our eigenvalue calculations, which we'll remember in a second. But I want to tell you the roots to this equation. And I actually want to do it without writing down the quadratic formula. I just want to show you how you can inspect this equation and write down the answer. Minus two plus or minus three i. That's a solution to this problem. If you write it in a factored form, it's negative two plus three i. negative two minus three i. You'll find out if you multiply these, you'll get lambda squared. Then you'll get plus four lambda if you do the foiling on the inside. And on the end, you'll get 13. How do you know you'll get 13? What's well, negative two plus three i times negative two minus three i? Four plus nine. Done, 13. Now, how did I solve the quadratic equation here without using the quadratic formula. And I think that's a little trick that's worth your while. So I will describe it to you, but on my website, I have the video that describes it and executes it and practices it. But I never want you to use the quadratic formula again. You know, that crazy thing that says minus B plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. This is the quadratic formula. That's what produced the minus 2 plus or minus 3i. I'll show you how to solve this problem without using this formula. Now, I have to be a little bit careful. I can't stop you from using the quadratic formula. I don't even want to. But I do want to show you how you can just snap that answer out right there without going through this mess. So are you ready? And I'm going to have to do several demos, but don't worry about it. Be patient. You'll get it. Watch the video. What I did is took half of four, the opposite of half of four, which is minus two. And then I squared minus two to give me four. Now, four is shy of 13. It's shy of 13 by nine units. So that shy of 13 tells me that I'm gonna do plus or minus the square root of nine i. If I'm shy of 13, I'm gonna need a complex number and I get that complex number by saying, I'll take the square root of the units that I'm shy of 13. Now, you have to see me execute this again, but say it again with me. Half of minus four opposite. That's the minus two. Now, plus or minus. Square minus two, you get four. Four is nine units shy of 13. Square root of nine is three. Since I'm shy of 13, it's plus or minus three i. Done. Let's try it again. Now, this, by the way, works whether or not the quadratic formula has complex roots. I'll say x squared minus 5x plus 3. Now, there's something you were going to use a quadratic formula on, right? Because there's no factoring going on here, right? So here's what we do. We take the opposite of half of minus 5, 5 halves, plus or minus. Now, I'll do some scratch work down here if you like. What's 5 halves squared? 25 quarters, 25 quarters. And what is three? Three is 12 quarters. So if I've gone past 12 quarters, yes, I've gone past 12 quarters to get to 25 quarters. How far past have I gone? 13 quarters. That means the answer here is 13 quarters square rooted. So the two roots of this are five halves, plus or minus the square root of 13 over two. No quadratic equation. Let's try it again. X squared minus six X plus 13 equals zero. 
I've got it with my 13s. And uh, I'm trying to make some nice ones for you at the beginning. Okay, what's the number? Half of my six is three. Now you do plus minus. Now square three and you get nine. And you notice that you are short of 13. How short are you of 13? You are four units short of 13. What's the square root of four? Two. Since I'm short of 13, I need the i. Those are the two roots of x squared minus 6x plus 13. Now, if you doubted me, and remember, you can always tell in mathematics if someone's lying. What's the numbers in here? Do you truly get zero? Well, if I do 3 plus 2i squared, I'll get 9. 2i times 2i is minus 4i squared, which is minus 4. Then I get 6i, 6i, I get 12i's. Then here I get minus 18, minus 12i's. And then I add 13. Well, I'm either telling you the truth or I'm not telling the truth. So the 12 i's cancel out, as you can see. And then here I have nine minus four is five, but negative 18 plus 13 is minus five. I got my zero. These are the roots. So as I've demonstrated this technique that I'm showing you right now, I can do any quadratic equation. A and I'm teasing you in a way. I'm, am I not using the quadratic formula? Well, if you look at closely what I'm describing to you, watch the video, you'll understand in a second, I am doing the quadratic formula with, I'm doing it in its two separate pieces structure. But the way I speak it is interesting. And the way I speak it kind of makes it easier to execute the quadratic equation. Now this will work on any quadratic equation, including ones that have number in front. But the problem is if there's a number in front, we're going to have to divide by that at the beginning to get started. So let's solve this quadratic equation right here. So I divide by three, x squared minus two x plus four thirds equals zero, then I take half of the opposite of minus two. So that's one plus minus. That's my plus minus part. Now I square one. And when I square one, I get one, which is short of four thirds. One is three thirds and four thirds is past three thirds. I'm short of four thirds. How far am I short of thirds? By one third. So I need one third i rooted. Square root of one third i. Now, I don't know if I want to rewrite that in a different way, because I, you know, one plus or minus one over root three i, one plus or minus uh, root three over three i. you got a variety of ways you can write this. Three plus or minus root three over three i. Oh, sorry. three plus or minus root three i over three. Of course, it depends on where you put the i. Now you're asking why am I showing this to you? And it's only because when we're dealing with two by two matrices, and we're gonna solve lots and lots of equations that look like this, lambda squared minus trace lambda plus determinant, it's just gonna be handy to snap out the solutions instantly. I do not mind if you use the calculator. I do not mind if you use quadratic formula. Do not use approximations unless you're instructed to do so. But if I can just know the answers in 10 seconds, aren't, aren't I happy with that? Yes, I am. Okay, so uh, chew on that, watch that video, see if that excites you. So you can solve quadratic formulas or quadratic equation literally in your head. Quadratic equation. Quadratic equation is when you set something equal to zero. The quadratic formula is the one that does it. So sometimes people mix up those words. They shouldn't do that. 
So I've given you a key reminder about complex numbers. The complex conjugates are a special gift. Do you see that? When you have a polynomial with real coefficients, if the answers are complex, they must occur in conjugates. Minus two plus minus three i. Over here, x squared minus six x plus 13. If the coefficients are real numbers, the answers, if they're complex, must occur as conjugates. Same thing right here. One plus three i, or sorry, one plus minus square root of one third i. Those are complex conjugates. Okay, the other reason I show this to you is because when we're doing these equations, specifically characteristic equations of matrices, we are not going to have coefficient in front of the x squared. That required extra work. That made it a little bit slower if I was doing it in my head. We're only looking at things where the leading coefficient is one. And this method is very quick in that sense. Okay, so I'm going to show you why you need to know that in a few minutes. Okay. I'm going to spend some time here in this first hour going over these kind of cute facts you can use to speed up your work. Now, I want to say a word about matrices because you have less experience with matrices, but still you need to know that good things happen with matrices. So I'll remind you of a couple of famous good things that were true about numbers that also end up being true about matrices with slight modifications possibly. And then I'll go back and do an eigenvalue, eigenvector calculation. In fact, maybe I'll use that to do my matrix facts. Okay, so let me show you a famous fact about numbers that you use every day. And in matrices, it's just not so, but something very close to it and useful is so. And so you don't feel shorted. In real numbers, you have something called the zero product principle. That's just a fancy way of saying, if you multiply two things and get zero, then one of them has to be zero. And that's of no use, or I said, that's of no end of good use to you, right? One of these has to be zero. You use it to solve quadratic equations. If you can factor a quadratic equation, into two pieces, then you say this product is zero. One of these people has to be zero. So either lambda is six or lambda is minus two. Now in matrices, you don't get it exactly like this. I can multiply two matrices and get a zero matrix, even if the two matrices aren't zero. And I'll give you just a really cheap example. So could you make up, and, and I don't even want an expensive or crazy example. I'm going to stick to two by twos. And remember, all of our work is being done in two by twos. So if you're good at two by twos, I'm satisfied. I can make an example on any size. But can I multiply two matrices and get zero everywhere, even though the two matrices aren't zero? And I just want to think about the simplest example I can. So here's a simple example. Here's a matrix A times a matrix B. And I get the zero matrix right here, zero, 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 zero. But not A or B is zero. And at first that messes with you. And you say, darn it, that's out the window. Like, 
that was one of my favorite things about numbers that when I multiplied two numbers got zero, one of them had to be zero. I used that a lot. But you have to think about matrices now in a broader context. Matrices are not like the real numbers. Matrices, complex numbers are not like the real numbers, right? The complex numbers are kind of an addition to the real numbers, uh, an extension of the real numbers. And likewise, matrices. Matrices are like super numbers. Matrices are like numbers on steroids. And they can do everything that real numbers can do, but they can do many things that real numbers can't. And since they're bigger and more powerful, they do not obey all the same rules that the real numbers do. So you're going to think about things that were naturally obvious to you about real numbers, but you find out when you deal with matrices, it's not always just so. But I can give you an way to modify this sentence so that it still works out. Remember, I used the word determinant. And the determinant of a matrix A, B, C, D was A, D minus B, C. I could write determinant like this. Determinant A, B, C, D is A, D minus B, C. And notice that both of these matrices, A and B, have zero determinant. So I can say this, if I multiply two matrices and get someone, not who's zero, but someone who has a zero determinant, then I can say one of these people had to have a zero determinant. Now, that sounds fancier than the real number sentence. It is, but it's not uncomforting. Let's try it out. If I multiply two matrices and get zero determinant, then one of these two had a zero determinant. And that's what's on display right here. Both of these matrices, in fact, both of them have a zero determinant. I could come up with another example, but this is not the example I really want to focus on. So. If the determinant of A times B is zero, then the determinant of A is zero, or the determinant of B is zero. And that is the zero product principle for matrices. Now let's point out where it's important to you. Let's say I have, and, and by the way, the thing that's more powerful about what we just said is that it works for any size matrices. It works even if the matrices are not square. Let's say I have a matrix called uh, A and a vector called V. And let's say A times V is zero, the vector zero. So I have two options here. Your first thing is, oh, one of these has to be zero. No, that's the real number thinking. So let's say it properly. Either V is zero or the determinant of A is zero. So if A times V matrix times vector, or vector is just a smaller matrix, if A times V is zero, then I'm allowed to say either the determinant of A is zero or 
v is zero. And notice how I have a real number zero here and a vector zero here. So this shows you how flexible that statement was I just used for you a few minutes ago. Now, where do I famously use this? In the construction of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let's do a practice from that last time. So I'm going to take a matrix. Oh, I want to make up a matrix that has oh, some properties I like. So I'm going to say 5 minus 1. I'm going to say minus 7 and 1. I think I'm going to say minus 7 and minus 1. And this is something I'm also going to do with you tonight that's going to be to your benefit. I didn't pull four numbers out of the air. I chose four numbers that are going to do something for me that I want. So by the end of the tonight, I'm hoping that you'll be able to do the same thing. If you want to illustrate something, you'll be able to pick the numbers in a matrix that illustrate that. So let's take this matrix and calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is just a little review of last week, described in your handouts. Remember what I want to do? I want to know the trace. Trace is four. I want to know the determinant, minus five, subtract seven, subtract positive seven. Minus five subtract seven is negative 12. What does that give me? The characteristic equation, lambda squared minus trace lambda plus determinant, which is plus minus 12. Sorry, it's a little sloppy. Remember the characteristic equation for a two by two. Is always lambda squared minus the trace of lambda plus the determinant. The trace is the sum of the elements on the main diagonal. The determinant is the AD minus BC. That's for a matrix ABCD. If I was doing larger matrices, three by three, four by four, and so on, trace is always the sum of the elements on the main diagonal, but determinant's a little more complicated. But this formula that I'm telling you works for all two by two matrices. And if we wanted to extend it, I could tell you the next formula. We just don't need it right now. Okay, what's my job right now? Eigenvalues, eigenvectors. So eigenvalues. Notice I picked numbers for A that gave me that a quadratic equation that I had just factored. And the reason why I did that is because I'm lazy. I just wanted something that I had already knew the answers to. Notice that lambda one is six. Notice that lambda two is minus two. I don't know if I emphasized that last week or even mentioned it. What happens when you add lambda one and lambda two? you get the trace. Six and minus two is four. Lambda one plus lambda two must always sum to the trace. Even better, what happens when you multiply lambda one and lambda two? Six times minus, 12, uh, minus two is minus 12. The product of the eigenvalues is always equal to the determinant. So we're going to use this to our advantage sometime soon. That's a cute fact. It's kind of a safety check too, right? Did I factor this right? Well, six plus minus two is four. 
uh, 6 times minus 2 is minus 12. I think I factored this right. Now, what I'm going to do is look for vectors that have this special quality that we described last week. So I've got my eigenvalues. Now we go for the eigenvectors. Special quality was that multiplying by A was the same as scaling by lambda. But to write this in a more practical way, what I do is I subtract lambda V from both sides. So I can write zero over here. Notice the zero I'm writing has to be the zero vector because lambda times V is a vector, A times V is a vector. Then I factor out the V. And at first that bothers you. If you factor out a V, you got a matrix minus a number. No, 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 you can't do matrix minus a number. Well, remember, I've got this special helper matrix called the identity. The identity times any vector gives me the vector itself. So in place of the vector here, I could slip in identity matrix is described by I, capital I. This is a two by two identity. I'm not going to write two by two because we're only doing two by twos. But you can have an identity matrix of any square size. So I could slip in, instead of just V right here, I could slip in I times V and write this equation. A minus lambda I V equals zero. But now I get a massive, massive break that uses the zero product principle, which we did illustrate last time, but we didn't practice it enough. Do you see what I just said with the zero product principle? I have a matrix. It's a different matrix than I started with, right? Because I got to subtract lambda six or minus two. And I have a matrix times a vector is zero. So that means either that vector is zero or the determinant of this matrix is zero. Now let's work out the determinant of that matrix with the lambda in the place. Pretend you didn't know these two lambdas. So you'd say five minus lambda minus seven minus one minus one minus lambda. So what's the determinant of that matrix? Well, it's AB minus CD, which is five minus lambda times minus one minus lambda. Subtract minus seven times minus one. Subtract seven. But when you multiply this out, do you see what you get? You get a positive lambda squared. You get a minus one times minus lambda gives you positive lambda. But you get a minus five lambda there. So plus lambda minus five lambdas is minus four lambdas. And you also get five times minus one is negative five, but another negative seven makes negative 12. So this is the repeating from last week that says, if I want to know this special case, if I want to find the lambdas that do this special job, I am working with the characteristic equation. The lambdas that do this special job, that scale a vector just like the matrix multiplies it, are the lambdas that solve the characteristic equation. So now let's go and construct the eigenvectors. Uh, sometimes I get my paper. A little twisted, excuse me. The other thing I'm like paranoid of that I'm actually recording the screen that I'm interested in, I think I am. So let's hope we're not screwing that up. So for lambda one equals six, what I'm gonna do is form A minus lambda I. Now this matrix A minus lambda I, we'll give it a name, it's called the adjusted matrix. It's not the original matrix A, but it's the matrix A with lambda subtracted on the main diagonal. It's been adjusted. 
So what I have when I subtract six, be careful that you subtract six. I have minus one, minus seven, minus one, minus seven. And I want to multiply by V and get the zero vector. I'm writing this large scale, just so you can remember what we did. When we do this practically later, we'll just fill in the eigenvector. In fact, we could just read the eigenvector right off the matrix, because what am I doing? I'm doing a dot product of row, column, row, column. So I need to find a vector whose dot product with minus one seven is zero. That'll cover the second case too, right? The easiest way to do that is to switch the two numbers and change one of the signs. I could either switch the minus one and minus seven and change the sign on the one or flip, flip the minus one and the minus seven, change the sign on the seven. I chose to change the sign on the one. There's no doubt that when I multiply these two matrices, I get zero. So V1, which is minus seven, one, is an eigenvector for the eigenvalue eigenvalue of six. Okay, you're going to have to excuse me for a second. I think what happened is my AirPods just ran out of battery. So what I'm going to do is go back to the computer speakers. I don't think that affects you at all, but I want to make sure my voice is still being recorded. So if you need to ask a question, you just pop in again. But uh, somehow didn't have a good charge on those. They're not meant to go on for hours. Doing eigenvector, but it's not fast enough. Let me do the other eigenvector and then we'll take a break. So the other eigenvector is when lambda two equals minus two. I try to get this all on one screen, but it's not gonna work, but I'll get this comparison down. So here's my adjusted matrix. Subtract minus two on the main diagonal. A subtracting minus two means you add two. So I get seven and one. Minus seven, minus one, stay the same. Seven, one, minus seven, minus one. But remember this. Whenever you form the adjusted matrix in two by two case, the two rows must be multiples of each other. You must have a zero determinant. And the two rows being multiples of each other are the only way to have a zero determinant. Why must you have a zero determinant? Because you multiply these two people and got zero. Either vector is zero or the determinant of this person is zero. So this is a safety check. When you form the adjusted matrix, you must always see that the two rows are multiples of each other. But this time, I'm just going to hop straight to the eigenvector, right? What am I going to do? I am going to switch the two numbers and change one of the signs. So I could use 7, 7. I don't like to work with numbers that are larger than I need, so I'm going to use 1, 1. I could use minus 1, minus 1. But why use minus signs if I don't have to? Notice that seven minus seven minus one, one times one, one is zero, zero. So this vector one, one is an eigenvector for lambda two equals minus two. Now, before we take a break, I'm going to take you to your little handout paper here that someday will be in your precious hands. But they're online. 
just haven't seen you since I printed these. On the third page, which is entitled Constructing Eigenvectors, Constructing eigenvectors is so important. I dedicated a page to it and I give you some tips. So remember these three tips. And I don't know if I can get that closer to the camera, but I'll try. When you are selecting eigenvectors, these are three important tips to remember. First, select factors that don't have coordinates in common. Yes, I could have used seven and seven, but why should I use numbers that are larger than I need? Also avoid selecting fractions. In the first one, I could have chosen one and one seventh as my eigenvector. Right here, I could have chosen minus one and positive one seventh. Check it out, it would work. But why should I complicate my work? Why should I use fractions if I don't need them? Avoid selecting fractions. Sometimes you cannot avoid it, but when you can. Tip number three, zero and one are your friends. Zero and one are the two nicest real numbers you know. They're really easy to add, multiply. So whenever you can use zero and one in your eigenvectors, go ahead and do them. That's why I chose minus seven and one instead of seven and minus one even though both are legitimate. That's why here I chose one and one instead of seven and seven or minus one and minus one. Okay, now I've got my two eigenvectors. I've got my two eigenvalues and we're gonna take a break and then I'm gonna show you or remind you what we did with them. And then we're gonna to be totally on our way because if you know how to construct eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you know how to solve any linear system. So let's check this out. Let's say 703, let's come back at 709. Okay, I'm gonna mute my microphone, stretch my legs. You can do the same and I'll see you in five minutes. If you have any questions, remember you can put them into the chat window.
Okay, we're back. Welcome back. And it's snowing again outside. I don't know why it's doing that. It doesn't need to do it anymore. Uh, and I just want to check something, although I'm not trying to record people's voices here. I see my microphone and speaker working on my side, but I just want to make sure I'm recording my voice and I'm recording in general. Can someone just pop up and say peep? Just, I want to make sure you hear me. We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I just want to make sure, I'm, like after any number of pandemic sessions where I screwed up the recording, I hope I'm not doing that here. So thank you. Okay, so I also want to say, I, I told you I'd select a faster pace for tonight and that's not the way I would naturally want to do things in a classroom either. The recording you have, you can scrub through a recording and slow me down a little bit. I wanted to make sure I said everything you needed tonight. If there are any, and I did not take questions, again, I apologize for that. If there are any questions you have in your mind as you're finishing things up regarding your test or anything else, I'll stay in this room unrecording. Uh, well, I will I will remove, I will stay in the room and answer questions for a few minutes and I'll remove any of that from the recording. So if you still have questions you'd like to ask, that's fine too. Let's go back and see what we've accomplished with these matrix, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Let me write them all on one page. And then you will understand shortly that this is truly what you need to solve any linear system. So I have a matrix right here, and I'll show you a nice graphic. Five minus seven, right? Minus one minus one. That's my matrix A. My two eigenvalues were six and minus two. My two eigenvectors, I'll write V1 to pair it with lambda one, just to remember, were minus seven and one, and the other eigenvector that belonged to lambda two was one and one. So let's hold on to that for a second. Now I want you to get used to seeing whether someone writes dx dt dy dt equals ax plus by cx plus dy or whether they write the derivative with respect to t of xy is abcd times xy or whether they write this with prime notation instead of the differential notation or whether they write fully vector notation, y is equal to, y prime is equal to ay, where the y represents the vector xy, and the a represents the matrix abcd. All three of these, and in the other variation, if I use primes instead of the differential notation, all of these are first order linear system. And you need to be flexible that you can recognize or use any one of these. So let me show you what our calculations here did for us. These calculations have solved this first order linear system where a is five minus seven minus one minus one. Let's take that. I'll use this abbreviated notation. Y prime is five minus seven minus one minus one times Y. And I'll say Y at zero. Let's make up two harmless initial conditions like 
3 and minus 2. So let's solve this first order linear system. Well, I say I have already solved it, all but the initial conditions, because the two solutions that I need to this system, they're called two linearly independent solutions are y1 equals v1 e to the lambda 1t and y2 equals v2, sorry, I wrote that kind of awkwardly, v2 e to the lambda 2t. But in my problem, we know what V1 and V2 are, so let me not be mysterious. Let me write them explicitly. V1 was minus 7, 1, e to the 6t, and y2 was 1, 1, e to the minus 2t. These two solutions control the whole system. They're called linearly independent because they are not multiples of each other. The eigenvectors, minus seven, one, and one, one are not multiples of each other. If I sketch them very shortly over here, you know, minus seven, one would be a vector like back seven down one. along that line. And one one would be a vector along this line. Here I'm using a scale of every box is two units. So two, four, six, seven, down one, 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 over one. I want you to think of these two vectors, and I'm gonna give you some graphics in a second, as streets. These two vectors form streets. And I call them linearly independent. This is a sense of linear algebra in that I can cover this whole plane with these streets. I can reach any point in the plane by using streets that are parallel to the ones I've given. And you've all driven in cities where all the streets are north, south, east, west, but not every city is like that. So two vectors are linearly independent if they are not multiples of each other. In the two by two case, in three dimensions, it's a little more complicated, but in this problem, y1 of zero, y2 of zero, are the V1 and the V2, because when you put in zero for T, E to the six times zero is just one. You put in zero for T over here, E to the minus two times zero is just one. So Y1 of zero is the eigenvector V1, Y2 of zero is the eigenvector V2. And because, and I've made this too crowded, so I'm gonna to go to a visual and mathematic in a second. Because these streets are independent, I can take my initial value of minus three, two, I'm sorry, of three minus two, which is somewhere over here. And I can reach that point by taking so many copies of one street and so many copies of another street. I can direct someone to that place by following those directions. Let me give you an example. Here, let's make three and minus two out of negative seven, one and one, one. Because these are independent, I can find some combination to be three and minus two. Let's just put constants K1, K2 in here, right? And now I need to solve, in a sense, two equations, two unknowns. 
Uh, this is not like always fun. First equation on the top row is three equals negative seven K one plus one K two. Second equation bottom row is negative two equals one K one plus one K two. I guess I don't need the ones. If I subtract these two equations, top minus bottom, I get minus eight K ones is five. I don't get a happy number. K1 is minus 5 eighths. But I can find a combination that equals 3 minus 2. Now, the problem is if K1 is minus 5 eighths, maybe I'll go to this equation right here. Because negative 2 is negative 16 eighths minus 5 eighths. I need another negative 11 eighths. Let's say K2 is negative 11 eighths. And you say, where did you get those numbers? Well, I'm doing algebra, right? And you can check that I'm right or wrong. I'm, I better check two. Negative five eighths times negative seven is 35 eighths. 35 eighths minus 11 eighths is 24 eighths, which is three, check. The second slot, minus five eighths minus 11 eighths is minus 16 eighths minus two, check. So now I have a solution to this problem. The solution to this problem that goes through that initial condition is minus 5 eighths times the y1 solution minus 11 eighths times the y2 solution. Let me write it down. Then we're going to check it in Mathematica. E to the 60 minus 11 eighths e to the minus 2t. Oh, sorry. I got to slip in this vector 1, 1. So the Independent solutions to this system, and you should remember this, are always eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t, eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t. And those two things, if they're independent, can combine to reach any point in the plane, like three and minus two. So now I'm gonna go and open up Mathematica and show you how these two solutions work. Now, by the way, before I do the checking in Mathematica, because Mathematica will actually solve them for me, to remember why the vector is x function, y function, top row, bottom row. So across the top row, I have 35 eighths e60 minus 11 eighths e minus 2t. Cross the bottom row, minus 5 eighths times 1, minus 5 eighths e60, minus 11 eighths e minus 2t. I'm doing this because these are going to be the equations. These are going to be the formulas that Mathematica checks, and they're going to be the formulas that Mathematica or I will graph to see the solutions. So what I'm going to do is go and download that sheet I shared with you. So here on our week seven page, I just want to download a clean copy from my Google Drive folder, First Order Linear Systems. I'm going to download this. Right. Make sure you get First Order Linear Systems and not First Order Systems right here. Uh, download, got it, open it up, put it on my desktop, and then we will take a look at it, got it, and I'm going to go backwards, stop sharing this, no, 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 just stop sharing that, good, 
and then go over here and open this notebook and then I'll share this. I'm gonna make the letters larger first. Okay, ready, go. So this is the notebook that I said for you will help you draw any examples tonight or for the next couple of weeks, actually. What I've done is pre-assembled this notebook for you just to show you some of the things that Mathematica can do. For example, our matrix was five minus seven minus one minus one. Five minus seven minus one minus one. Now, Mathematica thinks of a matrix as a list of rows, which is fine. You can think of matrices as a list of rows or a list of columns. But we input matrix into Mathematica's list of rows. So top row, five minus seven, bottom row, minus one, one, sorry, minus one, one, excuse me. Did I, did I do that correctly? No, it was minus one, minus one. Okay, I'm looking at the wrong picture. And then if you want to see it written as a matrix, you just tell Mathematica, show me what it looks like as a matrix. But you can also ask Mathematica to show you the trace, the determinant, the characteristic polynomial, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So there's the matrix, five minus seven minus one minus one. Do you notice the trace is four, the determinant is minus 12. The characteristic equation, which inexplicably, inexplicably <laughs> Mathematica writes backwards, the eigenvalues six and minus two, the same ones we did, even the eigenvectors, the same ones we chose. Now, remember, this is going to be either discouraging or encouraging that Mathematica did this in half a second and we took, you know, five, six minutes. First of all, you're going to get naturally faster at it. But you can use this to check your work. I have no problem with that. I just give you this warning that I've given you before. The Mathematica chooses to simplify things to please itself. So for example, when it writes a characteristic equation like that, I wouldn't suggest you write it like that. It'll just confuse you. Also, Mathematica will not always choose the same eigenvectors you do. You can choose many eigenvectors. Instead of 1, 1, you could have chosen 2, 2, negative 13, negative 13, pi, pi. Any thing that was same ratio as one to one was going to work, but we chose simple ones. Here, it looks like Mathematica chose the same ones we did. So it did, but it won't always. So I'm just warning you, as long as you know what your eigenvectors are, that doesn't bother you. Then what I did here is just let you pre-insert the window you want. Minus five to five is fair for all basic things we're going to do. If you had to modify that, you could. I let you insert an initial value. And the problem we just did, it was three and minus two, right? So I'll change this to three and minus two. X not, Y not. <coughs> Notice also I'm using X and Ys for my dependent variables, not Y and V. I mean, you can use any dependent variable names you like, but just common generic X and Y are fine here. So I'll hit return to send that information to Mathematica. Everybody's got a semicolon, so Mathematica doesn't show me anything. It offers to show me the output, but I don't need to see number assignments. Next, I have the matrix ready to input into Mathematica. So here I'm just telling Mathematica, this is my linear system. It's you know, this x prime y prime equals a times x y. I just wrote out the coefficients in the matrix. a11 is the upper left coefficient. a12 is the upper right coefficient. I just wrote out the matrix explicitly for Mathematica with the initial conditions. When I give it this name, my system, what Mathematica does is it writes the system down. It's, it's saying to me, is this the system you want me to solve? I say, yes, that is the system I just told you. And that's written out fully. X prime is 5X minus 7Y. Now I can do streamlines. 
and field for this. And this was the point I made at the beginning of our hour. I went in and I put in the right coloring commands for the current version of Mathematica. That's a little more friendly for you. Notice the stream points. I'm making the one through the initial condition X not Y not red. I can add other initial conditions if you like. I will. But here's, I want to see that system. I want to see that solution that I just calculated. Notice I had semicolons on this. So now I want to show the stuff that I did. So here, this is a different picture right here. So uh, our system is going to look different. That's what our system looks like. Oh, and now that I look at it, I see that I made the silliness right here when I had this line going at, at this. And I know you're not focused on my paper necessarily, but uh, minus seven and one would be up here. So the line would be going like this. I see that in Mathematica's picture here. Do you see a line kind of being judged here at back seven up one or forward seven down one? Here's a solution through three and minus two. Where's my three? My three is about right here. My minus two is about right here. There's a solution through three minus two. But let's add, oh, and, and by the way, if I wanna to continue to click through here, I can have Mathematica actually solve the system. Now, you have to compare this to what we wrote on the paper later, because here's another case of Mathematica simplifying something not the way we did. But if you multiply these out, you do get our 35 8 e 6 t minus 11 8 e minus 2T minus 5 8 e 6 t minus 11 8 e minus 2T. So I'm going to go back to my paper for just a second, and I'll come back to this notebook. So I want to take these two basic solutions, these two linearly independent solutions and draw them correctly and larger, and also the solution that I had a second ago. So minus seven and one, I'll draw it at scale, three, four, five, six, seven. There's minus seven and one. Here's one and one. Now let's be very careful with the solution minus seven, one, E60. This is a solution that's growing. As T goes forward, E60 becomes huge quickly. So on this vector, minus seven and one, I am heading out. If I had chosen rather seven and minus one, no problem. I'll go through this point. But likewise on that vector, I'm heading out. This is called a straight line solution. Now let's look at, I'll change colors. Uh, I'll pick green. Let's look at one, one, E minus two T. This solution is decaying as t goes forward, e to minus t gets smaller. So I'm at one, one, and I'm going towards the origin. If I go backwards in time, I go away, but I'm moving towards the origin. Or I could have chosen minus one, minus one. Any multiple will do. But now you see where the streamlines and that problem are coming from. So let's call this one y2, I think that's what I did. Let's call this one y1, that's what I did. So this is the solution y2. This is the solution y1. Well, y1 over here, but it's a straight line solution. I This is the opposite of y2, if you want to say it like that. This is the opposite of y1, but they both solve the system. And what do these two 
straight line solutions do. They divide the plane into four quadrants. And the behavior of solutions in those four quadrants you saw in the mathematical notebook, I'll go back to it in a second, but uh, I'm gonna pick a color I haven't used yet. Let's try pink. We'll see if pink shows up. At three and minus two, which is right here, it's not too bad. What's the pressure on the boat right here? Well, the purple pressure is to drive the boat out, but the green pressure is to drive the boat in. So what I get here is kind of a, and and what I can't do with my hands because I'm not that skilled is I can't make the scale nicely, but I get a path of a boat that looks like this. The boat is gonna be pressed towards the origin by the green line, but it's gonna be pressed away from the origin by the purple line. The combination of that pressing towards and away is gonna be that this boat does a side swipe of the origin. This is the point three and minus two. And I could have said that with any point in the plane. Right here, green drives in, purple drives out. Green drives in, purple drives out. Put a dot right here. Green drives in, purple drives out. This is a phase portrait. Of what? A saddle equilibrium point. The equilibrium point is at the origin, and my solutions to this system are bouncing off the origin. I can draw a lot more closer to the origin, like you want to see more dramatic bouncing off, but I don't need to draw more to show you the behavior. That's the phase portrait. Now let's go back to Mathematica and see if I can realize that on the graphic. So here, I'll go back. Here's my graphic. Yes, I kind of see that now. Can I draw the straight lines? Let's try that by adding some other. Base points. Uh, seven and minus one is not going to fit on my window. How about uh, minus 3.5 and 0 0.5? Let's make this one, as I did, purple in my drawing. And then let's try another one. I need a comma in here. Uh, the other one was 1.1. One, one. That's pretty happy to represent. 1.1. One, one. And I made that one green. Green in Mathematica does not show up. It's kind of a neon green, but I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, okay, it didn't like my green, right? But I do see the solution bouncing out and bouncing in. Let me add more straight line solutions and then I'll solve the color problem in a second. Oh, it didn't like the green because I didn't have a comma there. I think that's what happened. Yeah, see, and I don't like, the green's showing up on my monitor. Okay, I hope it shows up for you. It's a little bit neon-y. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take these two people and I'm gonna do them again. I'll slide this automatic down here. I'll slide these green and purples opposite the red like that, but I'll just change the signs to plus and minus. And I'll change this to minus and minus. So I just changing the names of the, directions. And you see the phase plane being chopped into four pieces. Now, if you want more drama, I'll pick points from all four of these quadrants. How about four and two, zero and two, minus four and minus two, anything that would be easy for me to uh, copy and paste. So I'm going to make them red. Uh, four and two red. And then I'll copy and paste that. Say minus four, minus two. 
And then uh, what did I say besides the one? I had said three and minus two. Well, what happens if I reverse three and minus two to make it minus three and two? I'm reversing my initial value. I just wanna see what happens. Now, it's a little bit tilted, but actually that's a phase portrait. I could add the dot at zero, zero. That would make it really solid. And that's why I say you should draw phase portraits by hand because it's easier for you to draw things by hand than do all this cut and paste stuff. Right? So do you see why we call it a sand. I'll use this logic in uh, calculus three when you're describing the hyperbolic paraboloid. But do you see now, I want to make this real to you, that the green solution and the purple solution, my two eigenvector eigenvalue solutions, do you see how they control the whole plane? Any one of those red solutions was just a combination of some green and some purple. Very beautiful. Now, on the rest of this worksheet, what I've got is, you know, here's the confirmation that I did my solution correctly. And I do have other windows for you to plot the X of T and Y of T graphs at the same time. So for example, but the problem is with this, your windows might not be wisely chosen. So these are the X and T and Y of T graphs of this black curve. Do you saw as that black curve increased? Let's look at this red curve right here. It goes from negative X's and negative Y's, hugely negative X, negative Y's, into positive X's, but it peaks Y's and then is heading back down. I see the same thing right here. As the black curve goes from left to right, the X's increase without bound, but the Y's reach a peak of about minus two and then go back down. Now here I'm comparing the graph in the phase plane, which was read above, to the individual X of T and Y of T graphs, the individual components that made up the parametric solution. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to my paper for a second, but we might come back and do some more graphics later. Stop share. So I think you know what we're going to say now. Uh, not sure if pink is great. So let's say one of these things is negative. That was Y2 in my case. And one of them is positive. What kind of action am I going to get in the phase plane? I'm going to get a decaying action along one line and a growth action on another line. They could be oriented differently. Their orientation is from the eigenvectors. But whenever you have a decay action and a growth action, what you have is a saddle. But what if both of these people were negative? then what would my action be? Well, I'd have a decay action along some eigenvector and another decay action along other eigenvector. Well, then I get what we call a sink. All solutions are sinking into the origin. And you can actually say which one of these kind of absorbs the solutions from the other? So the sink almost looks like a pitchfork here where one of the eigenvectors will be dominant and absorb solutions. But you have to be very careful how you speak this. The dominant eigenvector, dominant eigenvalue is always the larger 
eigenvalue. Here you see it. When one is positive, one's negative, then the positive one's larger. It's dominant and it absorbs all solutions in a sense. All solutions try to imitate the dominant one. Here in this picture, if solutions are being sucked into this line right here, this must be the dominant eigenvector and this will be the larger eigenvector. But be careful when you talk about negative numbers. Negative one, the number, is larger than negative four, the number. So if your eigenvalues are negative one and negative four, which one's dominant? The larger one. Not the larger one in absolute value, the larger one. Minus one is larger than minus four. Okay, one more time. If both of them are positive, now you can guess what I'm about to draw and what I'm about to call it. So I have two positive eigenvalues means I have growth in both fundamental directions. And growth in both fundamental directions means everything grows. And everything kind of peels off in this pitchfork fashion, growing. Now be very careful not to interpret this very casual hand drawing I'm making. I am not saying that these quadrant solutions become parallel to the dominant one. Let's say this is four and this is three. The dominant eigenvalue is the larger eigenvalue. But I am not saying that solutions become parallel to her. I'm saying that solutions grow in an exponential fashion alongside that. And they did not emanate only from him, lambda equals three, but this is as if as if they peeled out of that lambda equals three. Here, they were peeling into this number negative one because this was larger eigenvalue. Now, I gave you a mathematic and graphic for the saddle. Likewise, I can give you a graphic for a sink. And this one is called a source. So sink, saddle, source are your first three equilibrium point qualities. These are the first three things you learn about a linear system equilibrium point at the origin, sink, saddle, or source. And they're kind of like our sink, source, and node, but I don't want to use the word node. I like the word saddle because of the image that I've created. Okay, but the problem is, there's many, many more things that can happen. Let's think about my table over here. Oh, both positive, source. Both negative, sink. One positive, one negative, saddle. But you've solved a lot of quadratic equations in your life. Sometimes the eigenvalues are the same. What do I do then? Notice all my eigenvalues were not zero because I wanted either growth or decay. Sometimes you solve quadratic equation, one of the answers is zero. What do you do then? Sometimes you solve quadratic equation and the solutions are complex numbers. So it doesn't fit in these buckets. What do you do then? So do you see why I say there are many, many more cases in two dimensions? And so many, in fact, I've already cheated and told you that in the end, there are 13. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. We'll find out shortly. It's in your handouts. But so many cases, in fact, you got a problem. Say like, how do I know I got them all? How do I know I found all the cases? 
But this is where the quadratic equation comes to the rescue. If the quadratic equation controls the lambdas, and I know every possible outcome of a quadratic equation, then do you understand what you've won? You now know, in theory, every possible outcome of a linear system. These are just three outcomes, and we've got 10 more to go over the next two weeks. But they're not going to be as uncontrollable as you imagine. So keep repeating this to yourself. Because I control quadratic equations, I control linear systems. Now, before we take a break, I want to run a quick one by you and show you how you can actually have even more control than you imagine. So I want to run this in Mathematica. It's page six of our notes tonight. I want to come up with a sink. So I command you to give me a sink. How are you going to accomplish that? Well, you know, sinks are created by what? Negative lambdas. So let me show you how to work backwards. Pick two negative numbers. How about negative one and negative three, just for kicks? Once you've determined lambdas, do you remember how you determine the trace and determine it? Remember that the trace has to always be the sum of the lambdas. So now you've determined, you, you've given me a trace, you want a trace of minus four, you want a determinant of three. That tells you the characteristic equation you want. Remember, minus trace plus lambda. So give me, and you can type it in the chat, I suppose. Give me, left to right, first row, second row, give me a matrix that has a trace of minus four and a determinant of three. You make some furious calculations on your paper. Frankly, the easiest way to do it is to set up the trace and then make the determinant fit the trace. Anybody got a suggestion? What I'm trying to show you is that I'm not cooking this, like I'm not cheating and pre-preparing it. What do you say? Any suggestions for our matrix A? We can just make one up too, but I just wanted to have the fun of making it. Since I want a trace of minus four, I could try something like six and two, but I'll do minus six and plus two. That gives me a trace of minus four, definitely. It also gives me a determinant of minus 12, but I want a determinant of three, so I need to add 15. Now remember, I'm gonna subtract this off diagonal, so putting a three and five in here would be subtracting 15. Wrong determinant. But if I do this, it might work. Now I'm checking uh, the suggestion in the chat too. The suggestion in the chat was minus four, minus one, three, zero. That has a trace of negative four, no doubt. And it has a determinant of positive three, no doubt. So this would work too. There are many systems that have this trace and determinant. But let's run my eigenvalues and eigenvectors very quickly. So for lambda one equals minus one, subtract minus one on the main diagonal, I get minus five, minus three, five and three. Do you see how they have to be multiples of each other? I subtracted one on the main diagonal. That is hard to get used to. Subtracted minus one, excuse me, which was adding one. Eigenvector, 
three and minus five. I could not select a one. I could not select a zero. I was stuck. I'll just pick two numbers that have nothing in common. Lambda equals two, or lambda two was uh, minus three. So subtract minus three on the main diagonal. Negative three, negative three, five, five. If you do this work and the two rows are multiple to each other, then you made an error. So make sure that's in your safety check. Eigenvector. Eigenvector is, well, just five and minus five, but I don't want to use numbers I don't need. How about one and minus one? Two eigenvectors. Phase portrait. What I'm going to do is have a one and minus one, which is about right here, and it's opposite. They give me this line, which is, I'm doing it very quickly, decay line, decay line, because this is one minus one e to the what? Minus three t. The other one was three and minus five, which is over here, three and minus five, it's a little bit nasty because it's so similar to the other one, uh, or it's so tight to the other one, it's not gonna make a great picture, but it's also decay. And it's also four quadrants, not same size quadrants. This one is, uh, what do we call this one? Three minus five, e to the minus one t, which one's dominant? The one with the larger eigenvalue. This is dominant stream. So that means solutions are gonna peel into this stream. As if they came from being parallel to the other stream. Inside here, it's much, much slighter. Solutions are gonna peel into that stream and peel into this stream. But the effect there is very, very light. Now remember, this is a hand-drawn phase portrait. I don't know if I have the truly the scale the right, but I do have the behavior the right. So I'm gonna take this really quickly before we take our break and go back to our Mathematica notebook and have Mathematica crunch the solution and crunch the Face portrait. So I'll go back up here to the top. I'll share this with you. Got it. Not interested in that. Okay, so back to our matrix. Our new matrix is minus six, minus three. So do you understand the power you've just been given? You can make any system you want. That's a sink, a saddle. You just have to make a matrix. It's got the right trace and determinant. Look at Mathematica's choices. It does the same calculations we did. It made different choices of the eigenvectors. No matter, they're just multiples of ours. And now let's go through, and I don't mind if I choose three and two for my system, but I'm gonna put in my straight line solutions alongside here. And my straight line solutions would be, uh, I don't want three in that. So I want three minus five, minus three, five. And then I want one minus one. I'm rushing too much and minus one, one. And I want these people to be down here, and I want these people to be green. I'm rushing too much. I want this person to be purple. Let's just see what I get out of this. I want for a moment these people to be commented out. I just want to see what I get. I do have the system I sketched. 
but it is even more extreme than I believed. Do you see how these two straight line solutions are close to each other? Do you see that the green one, which was from three and minus five is the more dominant one, which is sucking in solutions. So I think if I wanted to illustrate this, I would pick two zero minus two zero in here. So I'm gonna pick two zero and then down here, I'll pick minus two zero, and then I'll uncomment that one. X stop, 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 comment, got it. And this should be a little more illustrative. Oh, didn't I choose that other one to be, I didn't hit return on this key, sorry. So you have to re-execute the line when you change something. That's a saddle. I'm, I'm sorry, that's a, a sink, excuse me. All solutions are being sucked into the origin and essentially being sucked in by the dominant eigenvector, which is green. Now, uh, Mathematica, dominant eigenvector, eigenvalue combination. Mathematica doesn't like to write things on top of each other. So when the red one came in, it overwrote the green one. Okay, that's a little bit distracting. If I took off the automatic here, I'd only see my solutions. But even that is kind of hard to read. Uh, remember, the red and purple ones are not parallel. It's just the red one is coming and essentially in a way from almost from the purple direction. But the red one doesn't bend back and touch the purple. And the red one doesn't turn into a straight line that's parallel to the purple. Okay, good. So what we've done is the three major cases, sink source saddle that match sink source and node from before. What I need to do now is teach you how to deal with the cases where the quadratic formula produces something else. And admittedly, the nastiest one is the complex numbers. So let's take five. Let me get my screen back in order. Make sure I haven't lost things or people. Got it. And if you have questions, you can also throw them in the chat while you're waiting. But I'm going to take five. I'm going to mute my microphone, stretch my legs. And then I'm going to come back and show you what happens if we don't have the happy, simple lambdas. So far, we've just had happy, simple lambdas. Relax, take a break, stretch your legs. We'll come back at 8.07.
Okay, welcome back. And now we're going to do a much more intense calculation. Notice my hand drawn face portrait. You know, when you compare it to the actual face portrait of Mathematica, you can criticize this quite a bit, right? So, I mean, I knew what direction things were going to twist, but I didn't know the speed or the scale of the twist like Mathematica demonstrated in this image. So, you know, you're you're welcome to draw things by hand, but you can also use the machine to give you the right scale and angles and stuff like that. The angles you can have from the straight line solutions. But let's get the big picture of what we're doing here. When I have a linear system, y prime equals a y, then the solutions are naturally composed of eigenvectors times e to the eigenvalue of t. And the reason why, when you insert this into here, this is worth pointing out. And I did this say this to you once, but you may not have caught this because of you hadn't done it in practice. Remember, when you differentiate eigenvector times eigenvalue, e to the eigenvalue t, what do you differentiate? You differentiate the e to the eigenvalue t. The eigenvector is just constants. So what you get is lambda i times the eigenvector times e to the eigenvalue t. But what do you get when you multiply A times the solution VI e to the lambda i t? In this domain, it's the e to the eigenvalue t that sits on the sidelines, and it's the matrix A that speaks to the eigenvector VI. But since this Vector is an eigenvector that belongs to lambda i. A times vi is lambda i, vi. A times vi is the scaling of vi. The e to the lambda i just sits here on the side. And now I've demonstrated that I have a solution. So my base solutions are eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t. That's my fundamental principle. That's a big picture. The thing that I'm worried about, the thing that you're concerned about, is what happens if your eigenvalues are uglier? What happens if they're zero? What happens if you have two that are the same? How do you get independent answers? What happens? Let's might as well attack the biggest monster first. What happens if that's a complex number? What do you mean e to the complex number? Well, actually you've done it before. Maybe you remember, maybe not, but I'll show you, I'll remind you. But first of all, take this as your fundamental tenet of faith in differential equations. And when you have a system, solution to the system is eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t. Now, this fundamental truth, this big picture, is actually true no matter what size matrices you end up using someday. We're only going to do two by twos, but this is always going to be the case that you seek eigenvector e to the eigenvalue t. Okay. Might as well just... Go after the biggest monster we can think of. 
what happens if the eigenvalues are complex numbers? So let's create such a matrix. But again, I want to remind you, you are the matrix master. You are the scale master. You are the one that creates the problems. So instead of trying out 50 combinations of four numbers until I accidentally find one that I want, why don't I work backwards as I did previously and give you two complex eigenvalues that you will walk backwards into a matrix. So let me pick my complex eigenvalues. Remember, since the trace and determinant have to be real numbers, since lambda squared minus trace lambda plus determinant has to be real coefficients, two-dimensional quadratic two-degree equation, these have to be complex conjugates. So that means I don't have complete freedom, right? Once I pick one, let's say um, minus one plus three i. I've also picked the other one, minus one minus three i. So let's roll with this. What's the trace of the matrix I seek? Remember, trace is sum of eigen values. When you sum these, the imaginary parts sum to zero, I get minus two lambda squared plus two lambda. What's the determinant of the matrix I seek? Well, it's the product of the two eigenvalues. And since these are conjugates, the product is easy. One plus nine is 10. Remember that trick is going to save your life when you multiply a plus bi times a minus bi, you always get a squared plus b squared. One plus three, one squared plus three squared. One plus nine is 10. So remember this always that these is the product, determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, trace is the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay, now uh, you did it last time. Let's do it again. You understand now, by the way, that there are billions of matrices that have that trace and that determinant. I mean, you know, billions, billions, as Carl Sagan would say. But uh, I just want an example, right? So I don't want one that's too nice. I don't want one that's too hard. And how do you know what's nice and what's hard? Not until you try some, right? Uh, do you got four numbers you want to propose? And I mean, what I'm trying to, to tell you is you better have a skill. You need to have a skill that if someone gives you a trace and determinant, you can fill in the trace and then fill in the determinant on top of that. So make sure if someone gives you a trace and determinant, you can make the matrix. Or if someone gives you a matrix, you can find the trace and determinant. So any proposals? Again, we can just make some, and, and you're going to get more comfortable with this as you go along. Oh, well, by the way, as I saw the quadratic equation, what's the solution to lambda squared plus two lambda minus 10, right? Half of two negative is minus one plus minus. What happens when I square negative one? I get one. One is nine short of 10, so it's going to be an i, and the square root of nine is three. So that equation does produce those eigenvectors. Uh, I'm going to try 0, 2, negative, 5, 2, negative. Certainly has a trace of minus 2 and a determinant of 10. I mean, that is a fine one. I'll write it down. Thank you. But let's see, I, I'm on, I want to tell you that you have control over the examples you make up. 
Remember, I gave you in that sheet a whole page of examples. I just made them up backwards. And but there are other ones, and you can you can try other ones yourself and see if they work. But uh, I'll go with this one. Sometimes the presence of the zero means it's going to be a little bit less threatening of a calculation. So I might have picked four non-zero numbers, but let's see what we got. Okay, now we get into serious difficulties right away. Because what am I supposed to do with my lambda one is minus one plus three i. I'm supposed to subtract it on the main diagonal. <laughs> and I've never done this before. Like, a matrix with complex numbers in it. Now be very careful when you subtract minus one plus three i, you have to subtract the whole. So when you subtract minus one plus three i from zero, you get one minus three i. Negative two is not changed. The five is not changed. What happens when you take minus two, subtract the quantity, Minus one plus three i. Negative one. Minus three i. I always am nervous. I do that correctly because I think like complex numbers are harder than real numbers. No, they're not. Actually, they're easier. But are you, if, if you object, by the way, you make sure you tell me you object, but I think I subtracted that correctly. But remember, I had to subtract the whole thing. Now, I know how to make an eigenvector if I was talking about real numbers. I just switch the two people and change one sign. Am I allowed to do that here? Well, you know, like any brave explorer, what we do is we go forward until we crash, until we run into a wall. So the principle still creates perpendicular vector. If I switch two numbers and change one of the signs, I'm going to choose two. I'll switch that sign. Instead of minus two, I'll call it two and one minus three i. I got a negative, I'm sorry, I have a complex eigenvalue and I have a complex valued eigenvector. In a moment, you're going to violently object, but let's just play this as far as we can. Do I get zero, zero when I multiply here? Something is wrong. And oh, no, no, we're okay. I was wondering, I was like, oh, not zero, zero. But notice I do get zero, zero. Two times one minus three i and minus two times one minus three i, they sum to zero. You're a little bit nervous about five times two, not five times two, that's 10. But what's minus one minus three i times one minus three i? Now, before you square one and square three and call it 10, be careful. These are not conjugates. Conjugates are the imaginary part is different. So, what I should do here is say one plus three i take out the negative sign, one minus three i. Now these people are conjugates. Now their product is 10. And the minus sign here tells me the product of this and this is minus 10. So I have 10 minus 10, which is also zero. Well, it must be an eigenvector because it solves this equation. Do you see another problem right here? What about your safety check that these two rows should be multiples? Are they? 
Now, I should take nothing for granted. But these two rows are multiples of each other. But multiples of each other where? In complex land. If I multiply this first row by one plus three i, what do I get? I get one plus three i, one minus three i, give me a 10. And then I get minus two times one plus three i. But the bottom row is five and minus one times one plus three i. Do you see that these are multiples of each other? but they're multiples of each other in complex land. Okay, this is still not your most violent objection, but, but it's interesting, it's kind of fun, it's kind of interesting that I can still follow the same plan that I used on the previous pages, even with the complex numbers. But now comes time for your most violent objection. Do I have to do it again with lambda two? And forget about lambda two for a second. What in the world am I going to do with a complex eigenvector, eigenvalue combination? The problem with this is this is a complex solution. This, this solution is made out of complex numbers. I can't deny it. But the original problem, x prime, y prime equals, equals. The original problem up here was x prime is zero x's minus two y's. And y prime is five x's minus two y's. This is not a complex problem. This is a real valued problem. If I graph it in Mathematica, I would get, oh, some real valued system, some phase portrait of functions composed of real values. So now it looks like I'm off base because I have here complex vector times, well, I don't even know what e to the complex number t is. Maybe you've seen it and I'm about to remind you. But here's the solution. And here's what you have to remember. Whenever you have a complex number, let's just make one up, negative three plus seven i. Remember that it contains two pieces, the real part, and the imaginary part. Now the imaginary part is not seven i. If you learned your complex numbers correctly, wherever you learned them, the imaginary part is the coefficient of the i. This is the real part. And this is the imaginary part. And I call them that because if I was to graph this on a complex plane, I would go back set three and up seven. That would be minus three plus seven i, almost like saying minus three and plus seven in Cartesian coordinates. So here's the solution to our problem. Every complex number is made out of two real numbers. So if I remind you of a certain identity from your trigonometry class, and I do some little careful multiplying, what I'm going to learn is that every complex function is made of two real functions. Now, the problem is you probably have no experience with complex functions, so I'm going to have to demonstrate this to you. And as I said, 
if you really enjoy math and someday you're going to redo calculus with complex numbers and you're going to enjoy it because it'll be easier. It's called complex analysis. But right now, this is an entirely new idea to you and I'm going to have to admit that. So I'll show you how to break this down into two real answers. And these two real answers, let's call this YC for complex answer. These two real answers will be the two linearly independent real answers that I seek. And then because I have two linearly independent real answers, I won't have to repeat the calculation with the other lambda. In fact, if I repeat the calculation with the other lambda, I will get the same two functions essentially copies of the same two functions. And I do have a handout in the packet that demonstrates that, but we'll have to look at it more carefully later. Okay, let me show you how this complex function is made out of two real functions. Page eight. So what you need to remember, this is the trick that you need to remember that you may have seen, but possibly have forgotten. When I take exponential complex number, it's not so complicated as you think. All I have to do is write e to the minus t plus i times 3t. I just multiply the t inside there. But do you understand that a to the b plus c is just a to the b, a to the c? That's standard rules of exponents. When you multiply two things with a common base, you add exponents. Or backwards, if you're adding exponents, you can split it up into two things with a common base. That's what I'm doing here. I'm adding two exponents. So I can split this up into e minus t and e to the i times 3t. Now is the formula from your trigonometry class that you may want to remember. Does anybody remember De Moivre's theorem? Writing complex numbers in polar form, e to the i theta is the cosine of theta plus i sine theta. You can actually raise e to complex imaginary number, and you just get a complex imaginary number out, cosine theta and i times the sine of theta. So this can be expanded into a real part and an imaginary part. And that's where I'm going to get my two functions out of this expression. And there's still some very careful multiplying to do, so you have to watch this. Uh, I will also say this to you. In the old days, because people did not like writing cosine theta plus i sine theta, particularly if you look at old engineering books, you will see people write cis theta. This is just an abbreviated way of writing cosine theta plus i sine theta. It's just for people who are lazy and didn't want to write this. But it's not laziness, it's just a notation. You could write e to the i theta and avoid both of those. But I want you to see the sine and cosine inside them. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our yc. Move this under the camera a little bit better which is two and one minus three i. We're gonna do a, a fancy multiplication. We're gonna multiply by e to the minus one plus three i t, but we're gonna break that down into those two pieces. And this piece is cosine of three t, plus i sine of 3t.
But don't forget, there's an exponential decay attached to it on the outside. Now this, and here's the part where you got to concentrate, is going to be split into two big ugly functions. Because let's think about this carefully. When you multiply two complex numbers, all you do is create another complex number. And every complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. So this two is a complex number, two plus zero i. This one minus three i is a complex number, one minus three i. This is a complex number, cosine three t plus i sine three t. These are just three complex numbers that I'm going to multiply. Now, this person is a real function, a decay function that's going to sit on the outside. It's not going to participate right now. But let's multiply this number times two. But be very careful. I'm going to immediately separate it into the part that has no i and the part that has an i. So first that'll create two cosine three T and I've been a little bit sloppy. I haven't left space for my E minus T. What I'm gonna do is force it in. E minus T plus I. So I apologize for that, making that a little bit too crowded in there. But this person is also attached to the two cosine three T. And what happens when the I sine three T strikes the two? Well, that's gonna be an imaginary part. It's gonna be two sine three T times E minus T. Hey, watch that very carefully. A plus B I, the part that has no I, is when the real part strikes the two and it has the E minus T attached. The part that has the I is when the imaginary part strikes the two and has the E minus T attached. That doesn't seem so much trouble, but now I have to do it times this fully complex number here. So focus, when this complex number hits this complex number, what parts will not have an I? When the one strikes the cosine, I'll get cosine three T, no I. But when the I sine strikes the minus three I, I will get minus three I squared sine. Now minus three I squared is plus three. So I'll get a plus three sine three T. Again, minus e to the minus t attached to that. Whatever happens here, the e minus t is attached to that top row. It's attached to the bottom row. Okay, let's do the i multiplication. What do I get? How will I get an i when these two people strike these two people? First, I will get an i when the i sine 3t strikes the 1. But I don't write I sine 3t here. I already pulled out the I. Then I will get an I when the cos 3t strikes minus 3i. Again, I pulled out the I. I just have minus 3 cos 3t and plus 1 sine 3t, both times I. And the U minus t is attached to both. Oh, excuse me. Okay, do you see what you've accomplished? I'm going to have to move my paper up. But what I've done is I've split this complex function into two real functions. Y1 is 
2 cos 3t. Cos 3t. Excuse me, I move this up. Cos 3 sine 3t. All of them times e minus t. I could put the e minus t inside. Maybe I will in a second. The y2 of t is not the i part. It's the imaginary part. It's the real function that's attached to the i. And it goes like this. 2 sine 3t minus 3 cos 3t plus Oh, sorry, not sine, plus just a sine, not three sine, sine three t times e minus t. These are two linearly independent, but more importantly, real valued. solutions to my system. Now your only regret here is they are ugly. I mean like, how am I supposed to work with these? Well, let's handle linearly independent first. Linearly independent means their initial values are linearly independent. So what's y1 at zero? Now it's messy, but you know the values of sine and cosine appropriately evaluated at zero. You know what e to the minus zero is, one. So this says two times one, one plus zero, two, one times one, Initial value, 2, 1. What's the initial value of the second one? Again, you put in 0. This gives me a 1. This gives me a 2 sine 0, which is 0. Sine 0 is 0. But I get a minus 3 times cosine 0 minus 3 times 1. So what I get here is a 0 and a minus 3. And now I'm very, very happy because I get to perform a safety check. Because I'm fumbling numbers all over the place, you know, I's, I squared, stuff like that. How do I know I've done all this right? Or at least how can I check that I haven't screwed up yet? Look at the two, uh, one. Look at the zero and minus three and tell me where on this paper you saw them before. On this paper in front of us. This is a very important safety check. The two one. plus i times zero minus three is what? My initial complex eigenvector. Now I still could have made a mistake in here, but this is very comforting that when I extract the real parts of my function, their initial values should match the original complex eigenvector. If they don't, you've made an error. If they do, you may still have made some error, but at least you're probably on the right track. Okay, so now let's take my system. And let's make some graphics. Y prime equals my original matrix that Brendan provided was zero minus two, five minus two. 
times y. Let's give me an initial value like, uh, give me the solution through four, zero. Now, how am I gonna find the solution through four, zero? What I need to do is make four, zero out of two, one and zero minus three. Now, at first you're bothered by that, but remember that zero and one are your friends because this zero right here means that the number multiplying the first vector has got to be what? Two. Two times two is four. I'm going to get nothing over here. But now that I've got the two there, I can figure this one out by looking at the bottom. Zero equals two. And this better be minus two right here. What do I multiply minus three by to get minus two? Two thirds. Two thirds times minus three is minus two. Two plus minus two is zero. Got it. So that means the solution that I seek is two copies of y1 plus two thirds copies of y2. Now I'm hedging seriously because when I look at you, because you're, you're going to say, oh, well, then write the formulas for me. Thank you. But I am going to rewrite these. In fact, I better do it once just to show you, but I do not want to rewrite Y1 and Y2. I've written them once and that's enough. But let's try it out. X, Y. So two times Y1, I'll take two times two cos three T. That's four. Don't forget the E minus T. E minus T cos three T. And then I have to plus two thirds y two, but two thirds y two y two in the top slot gave me a two sign, so that gave me a four thirds sign. E minus t sine three t. That was the easy one. Sorry. Now I've got to do the linear combination, but I got sines of cosines here and sines of cosines here. So first I'll do two coses, and then plus two-thirds coses. That's six-thirds coses and two-thirds coses is eight-thirds coses. E minus T cos. And then let's do the signs. Two times three sine is six sine plus two-thirds sine. So six sine plus two-thirds sine. Six sine is 18-thirds sine plus two-thirds sine is 20-thirds sine. E minus T. In fact, this is a solution to this system written out in coordinates. But the fact that I wrote the E, the minus T's inside there is actually kind of distracting. So let me write it in a less distracting way. Since both pieces have E minus T, I factor this out. I should have left it factored out. And now I get four cos three T plus four thirds sine three T. That's from this first piece. Second piece, I get eight thirds cos three T plus 20 thirds sine three T. Let's do a graphic and then we'll call it a night. So I want to see this solution go through four zero. And I want to see if Mathematica can verify it for me. Now, remember, I can differentiate it myself, stick it in the original system. 
which is going to be a lot of work because it's going to be some product rules with the cosine signs and the exponentials. But Mathematica will compute the answers, but again, might simplify them in a different way. So let me go back to our sheet, share this notebook with you, and let's put in the matrix we were given, zero comma minus two, five comma minus two, Run the numbers. Do you see that Mathematica agrees with our eigenvalues and our characteristic equation, trace determinant? Uh, notice that it shows different eigenvectors. Okay, that's okay. I mean, you can choose any legitimate eigenvector you like to construct your solution. So let's do an initial condition through four zero. Uh, Oh, I have to hit enter on this. I have to hit enter on this. I don't want all these points distracting me. So I'm going to take out everything except the initial value and the automatic, because I want you to see what happens for all the other solutions. And this is the beauty of what happens. I get a spiral that goes through the point four and zero. Now, why do I get a spiral? And notice it's a decaying spiral. Go back to the paper for a second and let's see why I get a decaying spiral. This sine and cosine work right here is the sine and cosine of some ellipse. And you could do this parametric equations trigonometry. You can actually graph this and see the ellipse. But what does the E minus T do to my ellipse? It says you're on an ellipse, but you're decaying in magnitude as you go along. Now, the problem is I don't know the orientation ellipse unless I do the calculations. So when I run the Mathematica page, I see the orientation of this decaying ellipse. And I'm going to assign this name to it. I'm going to call it a spiral sink. Because I am sinking towards the origin along a spiral. That's exactly what I see here. The speed of the spiral, well, that depends on the speed of the exponential. E to the minus t is not decaying super fast. E to the minus 5t would decay super fast. It would almost not even see the spiral because the spiral becomes so tiny. But let me see if I can generate some other systems here. Oh, let's see if Mathematica produces the answers that I have. Interesting. So I'm going to have to do some work here to see if this matches the answer I have. Do you see the four thirds times the three cos? That produces the four cos. And the four thirds sine, that's produced there. The 20 thirds sine 3t, that matches what's on my paper. But I'm nervous about the eight thirds cos. That is not present. So did I make an error in my calculations there? There's two coses. Oh, this was two coses minus three coses. This term should not be present. Okay, there's the value of checking your work. Now, I should be a little more careful, but I've, I've uh, checked this work here in Mathematica now. Let's do some parametric plot. There's the spiral towards the origin. Nice spiral. And these are the decaying sines and cosines that make up the solution. In fact, if I could just run those for a few more seconds, I don't know if my solution was built on 10 seconds. Let me just see. Yeah. Do you see as the exponential, as the e to the minus t goes to zero, the sines and cosines get 
squeezed to zero. Like the E to the minus T is an envelope for the sines and cosines. This is beautiful result. So when I have minus one plus three I, the minus one is decay and the three I promotes a spiral. So what if my lambda one and lambda two were one plus three I? Well, this would be growth in spiral. That would be called a spiral source. Oh, sorry, I should go back to my paper. My apologies. What if my complex values were zero plus minus three i? What I would have is e to the zero t, which is neither growth nor decay. But I'd still have spiral. So what's a spiral that doesn't grow or decay? An ellipse. And so I'm going to pull out your handy notebook over here where I give you, and I, what I'm going to give you is samples of every type of solution. So here's a sink source saddle page. And it may be hard to see under this camera, but these are colored. I'm showing you the straight line solutions. I should have shown you two halves, but I just showed you the two basic solutions. Here is a spiral sink. I'm going in towards the origin. Here's a spiral source. You say, I don't see a spiral. Why don't you see a spiral? Because that growth is either 2i. That's pretty solid growth. And the rotation factor, the angular frequency, what is the argument inside a sine or cosine? What's a three called? The angular frequency is only one. So it's not oscillating very quickly, but it's growing quickly. This is a spiral. I'd have to go out to a super scale to see it. But what happens if I have complex eigenvalues with no real part, zero real part? But what I have is spiraling that neither grows nor decays. So let's give it a name, right? Orbit, that'd be good. But the name people give it is center. Okay, we're not doing too bad. And you've been very patient just to plainly listen to me. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not more interactive or I don't make it more interactive, but I will do this recording. I will copy these sheets. I'll get them posted. I'll hang out here for a few minutes afterwards. But now you know six of the 13 cases. You now know sink saddle center. I'm sorry, sink saddle source, spiral sink, spiral source, and center. You could be a little bit bothered by saying, oh my gosh, I haven't even got half the cases yet. But on the other hand, uh, you've actually got the major cases. You've got almost all the cases. You've got 99.9% .9 of all the cases here, as we'll have to illustrate next week. I have to mop up some border cases. They're called the bifurcation cases. And they're the cases where I repeat eigenvalues or where I have zero eigenvalues. And you're gonna say, what do you mean by you've got the major cases? How much more do those other cases take up? Why are there seven of them if they are so marginal? And this is the secret of how these cases connect, which I'll also show you next week, called the trace determinant plane. Okay, so I will hang out here for a few minutes. If you, I will cut the recording off. Am I allowed to cut the recording off? It's been too long. I'm allowed to pause the recording. I'm allowed to stop the recording too, but I think I might stop.